morning everyone. Um, we're here at the flow office today. Cedar's, Cedar's away today, so the girls have taken over. Bianca and myself, Mirabai. We both work here for Flow Hive. Um, Cedar's actually also my brother. And yeah, to celebrate International Women's Day, we decided to uh, take over and spend our day with our favorite ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're basically just gonna do a brood inspection, but more of a beginner level. We're just gonna show you, basically share with you our love of what goes on in a beehive, all the different roles, what all the ladies get up to. So I'm gonna smoke the entrance. Put our hoods on. Yeah, true. <laughs> Just get this smoker going. And a few cool puffs of smoke in the entrance. And then I'm gonna pop it down there just so the returning foragers get a little whiff of smoke. Um, so yes, bee suits on. Um, as you'll notice, Bianca and I are both going gloveless. We are experienced beekeepers and we prefer to work gloveless, but definitely I have them here um, just in case the hive was to get a bit aggressive. But if you're new to beekeeping, it really does um, help to feel very safe and secure. So often we recommend being well suited up. Also, some people are severely um, allergic to bees, so you need to be careful of that. But shall we uh, get yeah. in here? So we're taking off the roof and we're going to just remove the flow super. We're not going to actually take off the roof of this flow super. So okay. maybe we should talk about what this is. This, right. this is the, the hive tool. This is an Australian version um, and this is great for prying apart boxes and scraping off burr comb, but this is a particular handy tip. And also if you pull off this back window, it acts as a great handle. So let's go. Do you want to get that side? Yeah. So should we go above the queen excluder? Yeah. Yeah. So we're just trying to break all the sticky propolis. Oh, I think that excluder is going to want to come with us today. So we'll go this way. And we'll go to the back. Just separating it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, it above. And now Bianca's going to lift it off. Are you okay to lift it off? Oh, there's honey in here. There is a bit. <laughs> and I'm just going to keep that queen excluded down. Are you okay to lift on your own? Mm, yeah, but it's still stuck. Okay. Off you go. Oh, no, it's still stuck. Still stuck. <laughs> <laughs> The bees have properized this off. If you lift it towards you, tilt it towards you, I can hold the queen excluder down. Like oh, yeah. rock it that way. Oh. Oh. Gentle. No, drop it down. So sticky. I think it's going to come off with the excluder. They've gotten so, so sticky and glued it up that we're going to need to Ah, I see. So what's happened is some of the brood frames are actually stuck to the queen, queen, queen excluder and they've propolized it so strongly um, to the queen excluder. That Strong brood. Oh. They're a bit upset so I'm going to smoke. Yeah. And what this does, it just masks the guard bee pheromone or the sting, the pheromone that they let off when they sting. So... And it also calms them down. Just gonna see if we Sticky can brood. <laughs> get this. Bianca, mm -hmm. do you wanna grab it now? I think I've got it. Oh yeah. Thank you. You're okay. Oh, sorry girls. So this hive probably hasn't had an inspection for a while. Hence why you can see all this burr comb they've built has really gummed up all of the, uh, sorry girls. And just a question on that burr comb mirror. Yeah. Um, people are asking, what's the difference between that and propolis? Yeah, well, it's, it's often a mixture. Um, this looks like more wax to me than propolis. 
Um, so burr comb, they kind of just join up any bits they can't kind of get too often. And then you'll see the darker color over here is more of a propolis, which is like wax and kind of tree resin. You can see here. So let's lift this off. Sorry, girls. Looking out for the queen. Yeah, so we always check under the queen excluder, just in case she's up there running around, but she isn't. If, you, if you're worried that you can't see her or you're not comfortable seeing her, you can rest that somewhere where she has, um, like on the entrance here, like with your inner cover, so that if she was on the excluder, she could run back into the hive, because when she's in laying mode, um, it's not very easy for her to fly. This here is brace comb. It's just where the bees are holding the frames in place and it's good to just scrape it out a bit before you're pulling out the frame. And I like to keep all this rather than throw it away or chuck it back in the hive because mm. it's, yeah, it's just good practice to avoid leaving wax lying around. Spreading pathogens. And you can uh, add this to your supplies for um, making honeybee wraps later. Yeah. <laughs> or candles or Oops. something like that. Um, we're just cleaning up. Which will make it a bit easier next time we uh, open the hive as well. You never quite know what you're going to get with bees. I also like to do this, not so much, but just to avoid squishing bees when you put the queen excluder back on. Yeah. Because you can imagine bees will get stuck in here. It's quite impossible to avoid that. Watch out. But you also have, need to remember that bees encapsulate the whole hive with their propolis and wax because they like to keep it clean and um, keep away all the bad bacteria. So keep in mind that they do that for a reason. So it's good to support them with their own choices. All right, I have to um, I have to bust out the macro lens here because okay. we've got some cute action happening. <laughs> so you can see here that we've got these little bees here lapping up a little bit of nectar that's been stored. All right, I'm going to take out the first frame. So with my hive tool, I'm just prying it apart like that. That wax and propolis in there. And then I'm getting this pointy and leveraging off the next frame. Lifting it up with my right hand, using the other side. Putting it up there, so then I can put my hive tool down. And then lift up the frame with two hands. What can you see that side? Oh, we've got lots of bee bread on this side actually. And we've Same also got we've got a lady with some nice white light pollen there. Let's see if I can get a close up of that. Oh, and some orange pollen as well. So all the different colours of pollen are reflective of all the different flower sources. And one lady bee forager will only attend the same flower in her flight and then she'll come back to the same spot in the hive and deposit it in the little same little section. So that's why you, you keep all those different colours. And it's a sign of diversity with all the, the rainbow of colours, which is awesome. Yeah, they need a nice diverse range of pollen. So when you look at a comb like this, what you're looking at is, is 90, probably more than 95% of these are worker bees, which are female. These are the little worker bees. See here this slightly bigger one, that's a drone. Um, and here's a male bee. And in a hive, uh, a hive of maybe 50,000 bees, there'll be a few hundred drones. Um, more in the springtime, less as, as winter, autumn months, they get kicked out. But yeah, so the worker bees are the ones that do all the roles in the hive. Basically, they um, raise the brood, they're the nurses, they- Make the wax. Make the wax. Foragers, cleaners, feeders. Yeah, take so they care go- of the queen. They, they live for about six weeks and about half their life is spent as a, as a house bee and the other half is spent as a field bee. And so when they're in the house, they're nursing, they're making uh, royal jelly, they're 
making wax, building comb, um, and all those wonderful things. They're incredibly hard workers. I'm just going to give a little bit more smoke. Maybe we can have a look. And so typically on the edge, like we saw there, we had pollen and a bit of honey stores. Um, the makeup of a hive usually is that the brood will be in this central section and then on the outer edges you'll get more pollen stores and bee bread and honey stores and the drones are usually around the edges as well. So the most sort of heart of the hive, the brood is in the middle. Do you want to do another frame or mm -hmm. do you want me to? Yep. Wow, it's hot in the sun today. And if you have any questions, Trace is here, but she's not mic today, so she has to come close so that we can hear her. I might just throw in, um, Fred Dunn's just joined us. Oh, hey, Fred. Fred. <laughs> He's a little concerned because he can see you've both got rings on, or M Bianca has maybe. What if you get stung? He's worried that what you do might you mean? be able to get your ring off. Oh, oh, just be careful. That one's quite fragile, that frame. It is, and the frame's actually broken. Oh, well, don't tip it. Don't tip it. No, oh. no, 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 no. It's not good. Don't got it. It's not too fresh comb. But yeah, this is very fragile. So this is a great example of when a brood frame breaks. Um, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. Uh, so what we can do, we don't have any elastic bands, bands. but what we would do right now is, is um, repair that by... So what's happened is this bit here of the brood frame, see the staple? There's two staples in there, but it's actually... Ah, I see. Yeah, That's what's so happened. This is a bit of a disaster. Not yet, but it could be. But yes. what we need to do is we need to go get elastic bands to keep that in place. So if it did fall, it's actually supported and it wouldn't collapse in the hive and actually kill bees and yep. potentially the queen. Yep. So, so I'm going to... Put, yeah, yeah so it. maybe Trace could go, we could just put that to the edge there. And be really, really gentle with it. And then we'll come back and we'll rubber band and show you how to fix that. Sweet, this is a great hive to inspect. So many <laughs> little obstacles, which is awesome for beginners. Which is great because you never know what you're going to get when you open a beehive. That's and right, so, you should open a beehive. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, so see, we've got all gentle, calm movements and the bees are really, really friendly happy with us so it's mindful to be slow and gentle yeah so here you're seeing um we're seeing capped worker brood here so the female bees they they the worker brood is is um it's kind of uh they spin a little cocoon in there so you can see it's like opaque it's not um we'll show you some capped honey oh actually here's an example of capped honey this one is a more translucent capping the capping can also be quite white as well um, so yeah, this is capped honey and this is capped brood. It looks very different. And as a new learn, like what looks like what, and you can see down here, we've got some nectar being stored. You can kind of see that glossy sheen. Same on this side. Same on that side. Okay. And I wonder if we can see any eggs or Ooh. young larvae in there. No, I don't really see any, but I, we should have a look at the next frame, maybe. We should start seeing. Just put a bit of smoke to get those bees out of the way. Alright, so we're getting to the centre of the hive now. We're keeping an eye out for the queen. Um, that's a lovely brood pattern. We've got this beautiful, um, almost wall to wall of worker brood. How does it look that side? Yeah, it's like almost half on this side of perfectly cat brood here. And then the other half looks to be nectar. Yeah. And you'll see the way that Bianca moved that frame we're working with foundationless frames and so do you want to just show again mm -hmm. so she looked at one side and then to look at the other side because we don't have wire or foundation she rotates it away from herself and then flips it and then you can look at the other side and then flip it back 
So that's no queen yet, no queen yet. But yeah, that's how you need to work when you're working with foundationless. Oop, bit of bit of brace comb. So Bianca's just cutting that brace comb so it doesn't rip the frame as she lifts it up and then just slowly so lifting it up. It's more nectar. More brood on the side. It's interesting that their pattern of brood, it's they've just do, uh, cover half of the frame, like perfectly half. And then yeah. the other side's nectar. More, so you know you can see that it's like there's the honey, kind of band of honey, and then the brood generally will be here. And often in between there, you'll have some um, bee bread, which you do here. There's a bit of pollen and bee bread around the edges of the brood. I can see larvae on this side. Oh, great. What about that side? Mm. It's a bit hard in the shadow, oh, but yeah. maybe I could do. Just going to see if we could see any. But you can tell that this comb is quite fresh because um, it is quite light, so this was a swarm caught, I believe, like about two months ago or less, yeah. maybe four, six weeks ago. Yeah. So you need to be really gentle with the frame, and particularly because it's foundationless, because it is very fragile. Yeah, I can see a little larvae on this side, but I imagine it'd be quite difficult to see with the camera. But in this bottom corner down there, if you if you get the camera on the right angle of the cell, all the cells point upwards. Which maybe is, I can try and show us with the macro where was it down here yeah in the bottom corner and they're all oh yeah they're really really tiny let's see if we can oh you can just see at the bottom of that cell you can see they're in a pool of royal jelly which yeah. is really a sign of a healthy hive plenty of forage about And I just notice this. that every time I put the frame back in the hive, it's going in exactly the same order. Yeah. I just decided I wanted to get in on the action. Um. Still keeping an eye out for our yeah, she's queenie, but we haven't spotted her yet. We may have missed her. So here we've got a freshly hatch, hatched worker bee. See how she's like, she's white and furry and fluffy and really new. And then the first role they do is they clean, they clean cells. Here's another one, but this one here, just above my finger, little, little and fluffy. So they clean and then they become nurses where they nurse and feed the brood. A little fun fact is that a brood Sorry, a developing brood, like a larva, will be visited 10,000 times in a day from a worker bee. It's crazy. And they don't they grow to like 1,500 times their size in like five days yeah. or something crazy. So that little egg hatches and then the larva develops so incredibly quickly. Tough job being a nurse bee. Tough job <laughs> being a worker bee. Yeah. <laughs> She will die in the field working. <laughs> I'm going to only live for about 42 days in her, in her life, and that is working every single day. And then the drone bees, who don't have a stinger, their only objective in life is to mate with a the queen. They just hang about all day and be fed by the worker bees. <laughs> and we'll go to a drone congregation right. area in the afternoon. Here she, find she the queen. is. Hey, Majesty. She's run off. Oh, there she is. Oh, no, she's, hang on. Did she jump around the other side? Yeah. Um, there she is in the middle. Holding her over the hive. Thanks, B. Because I don't want her to drop off suddenly. She's big and juicy. <laughs> she looks good. Oh, she's a runner. <laughs> Sometimes they uh, run away from the light because they don't like the 
the bright light. Oh, did she just drop off me? Again, I'm just holding her over. Can you see her? I think she just she she just she off. was like, I'm out. Yep. All right. So I'm gonna be really careful putting this. Oh no, there she is. She's still there. Oh yeah. But I'm gonna be really careful because I know that she's on this frame when I'm putting this frame back in. So we'll hate to roll our queen because this hive seems to be doing really well. Yeah, this could almost be super. Yeah, actually, I, it, well, we, it has a super on it. Already. Oh, it does, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're, they're filling it, and then it's not super full yet. Do you want to do that last frame? So this is likely to be honey, this last one, and then we'll go back at. Oh, there's a bit of fur comb in there. I'm going to brace comb on that edge, which I'm just going to scrape down. All right. Yeah, and it's heavier, so we yeah. know that's honey. So honey is always heavier than um, brood. Oh, the queen's on this one now. Oh, has she run over? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's like, ah, I'm out of here, you guys. Um, She's in the bottom left. Oh, now she's going on the other side. Is she? <laughs> yeah. She's a runner. Oh, she is too. There she is. So from her behaviour, I would put that frame back. Just she's getting a bit runny. She's a bit, a bit, possibly a bit annoyed that we're <laughs> sticking her in daylight. So we don't want her to jump or fly. Just so pop her back in. Another little trick that I actually learnt from Mira is when you return a frame to a hive, put them all together. So then at the end, you just have to do one single motion backwards out risking killing any more bees because you've already put the, all the frames together. Yeah, That's I love that one. Trick. I love that one too. Well, that was taught to me by a beekeeper in Germany. Ah, and so there we go. There's such a lovely, lovely tradition of passing on that knowledge. And now we just taught a whole bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and, um, so this frame what we'll have to do we'll have to eventually replace this frame and yep. it does have a few bits of brood so what i would be inclined to do is keep it on the outside so eventually over time this brood will make its way this way over cycles of brood development and so event the plan is that this frame will actually become honey and then that is safe to take out of the hive so when we return this other frame we'll put it here rather than here and we'll put this frame on the outside, so then with the intention to actually replace this frame because hopefully it'll be full of honey. And then we can eat yummy honeycomb. Yeah. Okay, so this is so. All right, sorry. I will help you rather than stalk bees. <laughs> this is still going to be super tricky. Yeah, to try and. And if it's not, we can always shake the bees off and take it. Yeah. But it is actually. It's got quite, yeah, it's a, got bit quite a bit of brood. So, all right. Yeah. So, do you want to. Oh, I've got the elastic bands around my wrist. Okay, I'll hold it. And we'll try and push so I'll put that. this frame in now. Yeah, you so can this see how that's popped up. The, the um, staple that was holding in place was just not quite holding, and when we pulled it up, it came loose. So if I rest that end there, that was the edge though. Oh, but we're swapping it. Yeah, that's right. I'm just going to push that down and see if I can. Mm, that would be handy. Yeah. Yeah, super fragile. That it's like split right up the top. Yeah. So that is a, another sign that new comb is super fragile. And then I will hold it here so that you can get in there. And we're just just giving them a bit more. Try not to squish bees. Support to hold that comb I'll while they fix. The yeah, I was going to say maybe one on the end. So that they can fix that big crack that happened when we lift. Oh, it's not quite big. Um, and then it's not crazy, it's amazing that the bees will actually chew this elastic band and dispose of it outside the hive. Very, very. Just right on the end there, I think. Where oh, the, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the bees will just chew back the rubber. It's 
it's pretty amazing. So if amazing. you see all this strange material coming out of the hive, it looks like spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> so that looks safe, at least for now. Yeah. Yeah, that looks heaps better. You can see that it cracked along there and the bees are actually already cleaning and joining that crack back up again. We could even take that honey frame, but we won't do that today because it's still nectar. So in a bit, I would be inclined to, um, when that's capped with honey, that would be ripe for consumption. Um, and we could take that honey, as long as there's enough honey upstairs in the, in the, in the flow super. I'll give you that frame. And gonna, that would make I'm just going to move that over a little bit more. It's a little bit tight. Any more questions, Chase? Yeah, look, there's some great questions coming in. Of course, people always ask, um, they want to know what lens you're using. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, so, I use two different lenses, but the lens I'm using today is um, a macro, a prime macro lens from a company called Moment. Um, I'll show you here. So, it's a lens that clips onto the case. Um, just twists off like this and mostly when I'm filming these I'll always use um, almost always use the slow motion setting on the Apple app and so let's see if we can get can I give you that mm -hmm. get a nice shot of a little bee here doing something cool here we go Um, there's also another company called Stylus that do a type of um, a type of lens that flips out on the back, which I have on one of my other phones. But I find this this lens that the nicest. Um, let's see. You can see all the little hairs all over her body. <laughs> oh, they're so cute. Um, look, you were just talking too about you could take out maybe some of that honeycomb mm -hmm. because it's a question get, that gets asked a lot, mm. can you get honeycomb out of the flow hive? Yeah. And so if you were to take, like you were saying, some of the honeycomb, would you just put an empty frame back in yes. to well, replace it? Well, the, the intention or, for this was just to manage this frame. You generally would never take honeycomb out of the brood box that's just a general rule because this is their space and it's relative to how much honey stores you need at time of year in your location whether to what honeycomb you take can take out but with the flow you can have a, a hybrid flow super which allows you to harvest honeycomb and flow honey from the one super so that's a great option but from here generally well, no but you can so that's you, where, theoretically, where every yeah. two beekeepers there's three opinions <laughs> so this is yet it's another example <laughs> well Yes, in times of excess, in times of strong nectar flow, where the colony is storing lots of excess honey, honey definitely. and sometimes they can get honey bound, if there is a frame on the edge that is capped, you can remove that honey. But like Bianca said, you know, this is their space, so you wouldn't want to be taking honey stores from their brood box, you know, late in the season. So you really need to get to know your local season. And, you know, part of being a beekeeper, like, you know, the biggest part of being a beekeeper is, is learning how to manage this space and these bees to, to give them what they need to thrive. And then they can store excess honey in your super. And if you're lucky, you get to have some sweet bonus of the honey reward. But actually, you know, the p beekeeping part of it is the most rewarding and fascinating part, <laughs> actually. Um. Angela's asking, the, the bees seem so calm, and a couple of people have asked this question, what type of bees are these? Do you know what, uh, mm, uh, they're obviously Apis mellifera, which is European honeybee, but then in Australia where we are, we've got different streams of that, um, like such as Caucasian, uh, Carniolan, and Ligostica, which is Italian, and I think these are, the Italians are generally more orange. Yeah. I believe these ones are potentially Caucasian. But it's they could be a blend. Uh, yeah, I was so going to say, in our apiary here, because, it's probably a bit of a blend. Yeah. So these would probably be a blend. But this is Apis mellifera, honey, European honeybee. And yeah, we do have, we do try and keep um, quite docile bees um, because, you know, we've got a lot here in, in kind of 
we've got neighbors <laughs> we, we don't want to have aggressive bees but um also you know part of um working with the bees is is listening to them you know when we were first trying to get that super off and we lifted some of the brood frames you could hear the noise they made they, were they got angry and annoyed and then we used that bit of extra smoke that calmed them and down. we calmed them down yeah, and we just sort of gentle. let them sit a bit but yes some bees are incredibly yeah. aggressive um, especially in parts of america where there's africanized strains um, i have done some beekeeping in a full suit and filming once with Africanized bees, gloves, everything. Ugh. And there was about 50 bees pinging off my face Whoa. constantly. So yeah, they do, they do vary um, wherever you go. So never assume that a hive is going to be gentle. Yeah. But we know these hives well. We, we work with these hives a lot. Um, and they feed off a lot on the way you are, your energy in the hive. If you've got erratic sharp movements they respond to like Ugh, get away from us but if you're gentle and calm and a nice sunny day they're generally always so kind and sweet <laughs> that's true and you and i are both yeah it's like you and, and you have to kind of be very conscious of your movements when you're working without gloves and i know fred said we've got rings what if we get stung i don't actually swell very badly but the more i've been st i've been stung hundreds of times but it doesn't really bother me but i just don't react anymore but that can go the other way for some people so yeah, you've just got to be really careful. And also, safety first, safety safety first, first. exactly. Absolutely. Don't follow us, make your own informed decision. And But also, there's so many times I feel like the bee stinger almost is magnetized and I'll touch a bee's bum and her stinger will go, Doosh! when she didn't even mean it. So not nice of me. But, yeah, yeah, but like then your own fault. The barb doesn't go in, so she still uh, lives. But, but yeah, it's inevitable to get stung. You can't expect not to get stung if you go gloveless and, in a hive. And if you do have a cranky hive, can, yep. what, can you do it? Can you do anything about it? You you can requeen essentially. When a hive gets, some people call it a hot hive. When a hive is consistently being um, very aggressive over a number of like times or inspections, then the beekeeper can often choose to requeen. So you find the queen in that hive and remove her, and then introduce a new queen from um, a queen breeder that breeds, you know, a good genetics, hygienic, docile honey producing bees hopefully mm, but you... also hygienic would be great too yes <laughs> that's why yeah definitely yeah you want good hygienic bees um yeah so that's all looking great and they've started filling the super we could have a peek in one of the flow frames if we wanted once we put okay. that back on yeah i'm just putting a bit of smoke so that we don't Squish those bees on the edge. Push it back a little bit. <sighs> Great. Oh, you have my hat. Yeah, so just while we're here and in the hive, we thought we'll have a little look and see how the flow frames are going. Ooh, lots of beetles. A few hive, small hive beetles. If you don't know what they are, there's one. <laughs> there's one I just squashed there's another one I just squashed so the bees can't actually kill them but they do try they and they 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 kind of muster them <laughs> they herd them into areas like this on the top where they make these little kind of this is propolis here they make these little kind of propolis um, kind of cages almost they kind of keep them up there so this is so to... they kind of manage them yeah that's the way they, they manage them. Yeah, they, they keep can't. them in a little, little, like, little area. <laughs> and then that prevents the hive beetle from lay, or the females laying eggs in the comb, which is what is actually causes the most damage. Yeah. If you have a, that's what causes a slime out. Yeah. Which is where a colony will eventually abscond. The queen may be lost and you lose your colony to a slime out and it's gross it's to clean so up. It's so gross. But, so the best defense against small hive beetle is just a really strong colony so they can manage it themselves. And, and also utilizing the tray with oil so the bees will actually push the bees sorry the beetle through the grate and then the way the beekeeper can manage that from the outside is just replacing this with oil see look we've already got some dead ones here yeah so the hive beetles fall into the oil and drown so that helps your colony manage so it's all you know everything we do is to kind of help and assist our colony function the best it can. Um, all right. Well, 
We can see that there's no honey yet on the ends, but there's lots of bees up there. So they have started working the flow frames. And I could feel it, it was super heavy. And yeah, so you lifted it before and it definitely has some honey stores happening in there. So just like a regular brood frame, you lift one end with the hook on your J tool and then always take the window off. And you can actually, there's another lever point just under the flow frame here. Also, you can lever under the flow frame there. So but now I've loosened that up. Oh yeah. <laughs> instantly feel that this frame wow. is almost full of honey wow so this is all capped honey and this is uncapped honey see it's nectar glistening on its way to being capped and the bees will start in the center of the hive and work their way out so it may look empty on this side but if you open it up you'll actually find that there's actually full of honey but i wouldn't actually harvest this yet no it's not quite there but it's pretty close just killing the hive bit. Why wouldn't you harvest it yet? Because if you harvested, say for example, if you put only put your key in this far, honey could be pushed out of these cap, uncapped cells here and out. Also, that is nectar. It's not quite honey, so it's still got a too high moisture content, which means that your honey could potentially go bad before you'd like. Where if you harvested perfectly capped honey, that's perfectly ripe honey that the bees have withdrawn the right amount of moisture around 20. 18 to 20% depending on the nectar source and that means you've got perfectly ripe honey. It generally means that it will last forever. <laughs> so if you harvest too early and there's too much water content, is that when honey starts to like ferment? Ferment. ferment. Yeah. yeah. It goes yeah. a bit funny. But Make could, mead. But you, <laughs> you could feed it back to your, your bees, but, but, if, but not in this context where they've got plenty of honey. Yeah. But in future so you could save it for them. a nectar flow. Time on the bees are doing great the brood's doing well we've but got all stages of bees and they're storing excess honey it's probably yeah. not going to be long if the nectar flow continues it won't be long until this hive is ready to harvest yeah yes i think a lot of people commenting they can't believe um, the amount how well the brood box is how much honey is there considering mm. you know in australia of course we autumn going into winter well, yeah yeah it's interesting here we actually through the summer months can often have this sort of rainy wet weather where we don't actually get that strong a nectar flow um, and then during the winter especially down at my brother Cedar's place we actually get a, a winter flow happening and so we really don't have what you would call winter here in in the northern rivers yeah we're in a subtropical climate. we're in a yeah very, <laughs> so very we um we are really fortunate in terms of keeping bees that we don't get those winter months which lots of you do and i have i was living in germany for the last few years and keeping bees and wintering them and i learned a lot about <laughs> uh you know you do really need to make sure you build up your honey stores for winter because when they boil down in winter they eat those honey stores and they vibrate their wing muscles with disengaging their wings to keep the hive warm so they're called heater bees and those bees go to the outside of the ball to keep the rest of the Rotate. colony and they take turns they're kind of in rosters they work to the outside and so they need those honey stores to stay alive i'd like to talk about this so here we've got an arc in the middle where it's uncapped this is generally because um, the bees leave this spot because um, that's where just in preparation for the queen to lay because the, the brood actually naturally create like laying a sphere shape in the center of the hive as that's the warmest area so then by default the bees actually leave this spare and waiting for the queen to lay eggs but just in case she can't because there's a queen excluder in there to prevent her from laying up here yeah but then the bees will still sometimes do this I'd find it that it's it depends on the colony but um, so this is actually another a reason just to be super safe before you harvest to actually have a look inside your super to know which frame is ready for harvesting because if you did, for example, put your whole key down this once at the one time and harvested, that could actually cause a bit of leaking through that uncapped arc, which is a bit dangerous. Um, but always, it's always a good idea when harvesting to harvest incrementally and slowly. So for example, put your key in a third of the way down, turn, wait for that to slow down, and then put it down another third just to, to help the honey, to manage the honey a bit more and prevent any harm for the bees. 
Bianca, just on that, mm -hmm. um, William's asking, like, do, do you always check the super before harvesting the honey, or can you just look at the end plate? Well, as a beginner beekeeper, yes, 100%. Um, because I you, think you... You have to learn to know your bees, and you have to learn yeah. to know the season mm -hmm. and the times when the nectar is abundant. Yeah, and as an experienced beekeeper, you can actually gauge a lot more of that from just looking at this, the front of your hive and understanding the, the activity at the front, which is indicative of the inside. Yeah. But for me, it's... Yeah, it's just with experience, you don't have to. But as a beginner, just with everything in, be in a beekeeping, it's, um, as a beginner, it's just really good to just be really super careful because you can't assume anything really. And until, as a beginner particularly, but then as you become more experienced, there's so much to learn in beekeeping and every, mm. co every colony is different. Every location is different, subjective to, to climate, location, flowers available. So, so many variables. So. And that's why you can't have one answer for everyone. So your answers for your colony could be completely different to someone who you've spoken to what their recommendations are. So it's about your own personal learning journey and learning from others in order to make your correct, the correct decisions for your colony. And so you, would you recommend people doing beekeeping courses and joining clubs? Or what is the best way to learn if you don't have a mentor? Yeah, so mentor is the best, most effective and efficient way I find because that is local to your beehive and experienced. Um, but if not, then your local bee club or association is probably the next best place because you've got experienced beekeepers there and you're also learning with other beginner beekeepers. So you can, you can learn off them and it's a very yeah inclusive environment where you can learn from others. But you do get a lot of different opinions from all different beekeepers which is <laughs> the culture of the industry always so it's like I like to blend everything and make so online learning with clubs face-to-face -face support because it's quite daunting to open up a hive and know what you're actually looking to at. apply your learning to yeah. a hive that could be so so many different things happening but we have we have the beekeeper dot the beekeeper dot org yeah. which is a great online research resource but it's also it's not just oh, beginner beekeeping but we're also using experts from around the world to share their knowledge so um, definitely check that out and so I wanted to show you this bee here is um, fanning uh, and I think we can see that she has the end of her abdomen tilted down and she's actually fanning with a Nazanoff pheromone. So yeah. the gland is releasing a pheromone and she's fanning into the air, telling her fellow bees, this is home, come back here. Because we've opened them. Oh, and she just stopped. And there's another one right next to her, I don't know. Oh, there she is, yeah. And you can kind of see it from this angle better just on the end of the abdomen there so do they share the same pheromone i guess they would because they're from the same queen yeah i think so mm, so they all they all give off the same pheromone and that's how they identify themselves so the guard bees the lady guard bees at the front they'll actually sniff all the bees coming in and if they smell a bit funny i'm not familiar they'll actually wrestle them yeah. tell them go away <laughs> they will. that's the guard bee's job another yeah. female to role to protect the hive <laughs> um Oop. watch out girls just... beep beep <laughs> hey, watch okay. out all right watch out how long do you think before the super would be ready to harvest this one jeez i reckon well that first frame we opened in it a just week. really depends if there's still a strong nectar flow going on or it's not it's not hugely strong at the moment so I would say probably a number of weeks if if there's a strong nectar flow happening so my friend's colony which is just about 30 minutes drive from here she's been harvesting and in two weeks the frames have been full again so they've been on a really strong nectar flow so it all depends you know it's, it's about the health of the colony the nectar flow that's around the time of year um, so this, they could, you know, run out of nectar flow and just sort of stop filling it. But, um, yeah. It's about what's flowering. So 
in yeah. my hive, I had frames replenishing in a week or in the start of spring. Yeah. But now they've totally slowed down. I haven't harvested for about six weeks. So, and that's, that's just seven kilometers down the road. So yeah, and yeah. it's very, it's very local. So yeah, you've just got to open your eyes and look for what's flowering. And the biggest resources for flowers are big flowering trees. And sometimes the flowers can be so small that you can't even, you don't even notice that a tree is flowering like a big gum. Um, but yeah, as, you, as you're a beekeeper and you start to observe and, and look out for these things, you start noticing different things. That's one of the cool things. Yeah, you drive, you walk part. around looking up at what's flowering once yeah, you become is. a beekeeper. <laughs> anyway. And you want to do the waggle dance to so tell them where it is. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, the sun is. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, thanks. Hope you learned something and it was fun taking over.